The congregators, that is not some kind of a beast like a crocodile. That is, and those are people like us who congregate. We get together and not everybody believes in congregating. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. But a lot of people believe that, well, we'll just have church at home. We'll get our own family together, maybe some friends. And that's how we'll do it. But when we look into the New Testament, that's not the pattern that we see. What we see in the New Testament is God's people coming together from all walks of life, from all age ranges, from all economic backgrounds. Slaves in the first century and slave owners would come together and they would all come together to worship the Lord. They congregated. And that's what we do today. That's what we're doing today. And you may have never thought to yourself, oh, we'll just have church at home and it'll be our family and, and that'll be our church. But a lot of people do think that way. And I thought, well, we've never really talked about that. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about what the Bible says about congregating. And the first thing I want us to do is open up our Bibles to a place we hardly ever go and that's the table of contents. Go to the table of contents for the New Testament. And let me, if you will, make a point or two from this part of the Bible. Now somebody might say, oh Marty, that table of contents is not inspired. Well, stop and think about it. What is a table of contents but a listing of every writing that's in the New Testament, and who decided that we would have those but God. So I think, I think the table of contents is inspired. And there you go. We'll argue about it later if you want to, but you'll lose. So. <laughs> looking at the table of contents, look at some of the names of these letters we have in here. Start with Romans. Why do we have a letter called Romans? Because it was a letter written to the church at Rome. That's why we have that letter. Look next at 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Why do we have these two letters written that are called Corinthians? Well, because there was a church at Corinth. And these letters were written to that church, to that congregation, if you will. And then there is Galatians. And if you start reading the letter to the Galatians, it says this is to... That the churches in Galatia. So there were several churches, several congregations in the area of Galatia. Then we've got Ephesians. Why does that letter exist? Well, there was a church established in the city of Ephesus, and this letter is written to that church. What's next? You see where I'm going with this? Okay, so I'm just going to finish this sermon, and we'll give the invitation song, because it's already been established that that there were congregations of the church in the New Testament, and the very table of contents of the New Testament seems to me to establish that fact. But I'm not going to stop there. You know better than that. Uh, and I know you might look at this table of contents like I did, and I say, well, yeah, but there are other letters in here that are not written to the church, like First and Second Timothy. That was not written to the church. Who was it written to? Duh, it was written to Timothy. But why were those letters written to Timothy? Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 3, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And you've probably already figured it out. But let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 14 and 15. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that, I write so that, Anytime you see those two English words together in the text of Scripture, pay attention. Because he's giving us the reason. So that, I'm writing this, so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the, in the what? In the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Why was Paul writing to Timothy? Timothy was a minister. Who was he ministering to? He was ministering to the church. That's why he was writing these letters. And he said, I'm writing to you so that you'll know how to conduct yourself in the household of God. What is a household? 
Well, that's what's considered a family. Household, family. We're talking about family this quarter, are we not? We are a family that congregates. We get together with one another, not just because we stood around someday and said, you know what, we ought to get together. No, because this is what we're taught to do in the New Testament. This is what we're exampled uh, for, or what the examples show us in the New Testament. So this we've got from 1 Timothy. But look also at Titus, because Titus wasn't written to a church. Titus was written to a guy. Written to Titus, another minister, another evangelist. Look what it says in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. Paul says, I'm writing to you, Titus, for this reason. I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Elders in every city. What's an elder? What's another name for an elder? A shepherd. What does a shepherd need to have to be a shepherd? Sheep. Now, how many of you know that shepherds like to have their sheep scattered all over the place? No, that doesn't work, does it? You, you put your sheep in a flock. And it's interesting to me that God continually speaks of his people as sheep. And the leaders of his people as shepherds. If that's all we had, if all we had was God's viewpoint of us and the leaders in the church as shepherds and, and, the, and the members as sheep, then we would say, oh, God wants us to be flocks, to be organized, to be together, to hang together. Well, that's, that's Titus. Well, what about Philemon? It's only one chapter. It's written to a guy. But look what it says in Philemon, chapter 1. Did you get that, chapter 1? Verse 2. Well, we'll start... Verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and, and what? And to the church in your house. The church met in their house. Now, this wasn't their own little tiny family group trying to pull away from everybody else. This was the church, the congregation in that location that met in their house. That's what that's all about. And then you look at Hebrews. Because Hebrews wasn't written to a specific congregation. You see in the introduction, it's, it's written to the, the people of God who are Hebrews. They're, they're Christians now, but they're from a Hebrew background. And this letter is written to them to encourage them not to go back to Judaism. But what does Hebrews say in chapter 10? This is the text that we often hear uh, when sermons about the assembly come up. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 24. Let us consider. What does it mean to consider? That means you stop and think about it. You, you take some time with that and you spend some mental energy thinking. Let us consider. Let us take some time and spend some mental energy trying to figure out how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. How are you going to stimulate somebody to love and good deeds if you don't spend some time with them? Now, I know Facebook. Uh, a lot of people get stimulated through Facebook. But it's not necessary to love and good deeds. <laughs> Telephones. Oh, we'll use the telephone. We can send letters. and All those things are good, but in the first century, how did they stimulate one another? They got together. And they influenced one another. And they, they so impacted one another's lives. It's almost as if they thought they were supposed to be like salt or something. Having an impact on other people. Or, or as if they were supposed to be a light in a dark world. They kind of, I don't know where they get ideas like that. But that's kind of what they had. And so this writer is saying, let's think about how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together. As is the habit of some. Now what's that tell us? There were some folks back then who thought, as people still seem to think, you don't need to assemble. We don't need to get together. And this writer is saying, oh, that's the wrong way to think. As a matter of fact, as you see the day approaching when you're going to assemble, you need to be thinking about how to stimulate other brothers and sisters in Christ to do good. And then you assemble with those brothers and sisters in Christ. That, that's what this passage is teaching us, if, if I'm not mistaken. 
encouraging one another as that day grows on, all the more as you see that day drawing near. Do you look forward to the first day of the week? If we don't, we need to stop and take stock. I know, especially if you've got little kids, Sunday can be such a pain. Did I say that? Any amens? You bunch of chickens. You, 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 <laughs> you know, you know it can be a pain. Because Wow, man. And, and there are things we can do to try to alleviate that. When, when our kids were little, we tried to figure some things out. We, we, we did for ourselves what verse 24 said. We stopped and we considered. Okay, how can we make this easier? How can we do this better? Maybe we can start getting ready for Sunday on Saturday night. Maybe we can pick out and have the kids pick out. What are you going to wear tomorrow when we go get up and go to church and have the kids pick those things out? What are you going to eat for breakfast? And then don't stay up until 3 o'clock in the morning watching the movie on PBS that you've seen 47 times. See? That's a word of agreement right there, I would say. say put those parents in bed. It, it, all I'm saying is, Stop and think about that. How are we going to provoke one another to good works? And how are we going to provoke ourselves to good work? We need to make some, some plans, do some planning, so that Sunday doesn't turn out to be the big fiasco that it could be. Now, if it turns out that your Sunday is a fiasco anyway, still assemble. You say, well, my kids are going to be cranky. They've had too much sugar and they didn't get enough sleep and they're just going to be distractions. No, bring them. Do I hear any amens? Bring them. Get them in here. We can live with distractions. What we can't live without is your children not being part of our assembly, not being part of our congregation. We want them to grow up here. We want them to know us. We want them to know these are the people that love me and care for me. And when you see that happening in the building, isn't it heartwarming to see people who aren't the parents or the grandparents of little kids visiting with little kids and playing with little kids and aggravating the little kids and doing what we do with little kids and giving them suckers so they'll go home and run circles around their parents because they've got sugar in it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's great. Now, that, that would never happen. That would never happen if we didn't get together. And whose idea is it to get together? It's God's idea. I remember... And let me make a disclaimer. I, I do not in any way, shape, or form want to put any pressure on our children because they, they do so well to, to come and see us and visit with us. But I know now that our two girls being married have obligations with in-laws, and that's fantastic. They should be just as obligated with them as they are with us. But I do want to say that just a few years ago, we had a Christmas, and the kids were there. And we were just together. And I don't remember what we ate. I don't remember what the presents were. I don't remember what the decorations were. But as a father, I just remember sitting in the living room of our home, just looking around, and here's our kids. Now, you talk about a blessing for a father. I'm testifying to you. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. And the rest of the fathers in here will tell you the same thing. So I'm thinking with God, how great is it in his eyes when the first day of the week, the day that John called, I believe he called it Sunday, the first day of the week, called it the Lord's Day. And we have decided that on the Lord's Day, we're going to be together. Doesn't matter what happens, we're going to be together. We're going to make our best effort so that Barring any unforeseen circumstance, we're going to be together. We're going to make plans to be together. We're going to try to stimulate one another towards that day. Because God's people congregated, and that is no accident. Well, this, this is the letter to the Hebrews we've been reading from here. But look also at James. It's interesting, James also talks about the assembly. He sort of talks about it in a negative aspect because of the way they were behaving themselves. But the point is, he doesn't say, since you don't know how to behave yourself, stop assembling. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly... 
Well, there it is. Man comes into your assembly. What assembly? Well, the assembly of the church. That's what he's talking about, the saints. Brothers and sisters in Christ. And then he talks about how they behave towards those who come into their assembly. But he's letting us know. It's like God said, James, let them know that the church is assembling. Because 2,000 years from now, people are going to say, oh, we don't need to meet with the church. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. You've probably heard that story about the fellow who was a leader in the church. And he went to visit another man who was failing to attend the assemblies. And they sat and they visited about that. And as they were talking, the man who had come to visit the other one got the poker and reached over into the fireplace and pulled out a coal and separated it from the fire. And as they were talking, you know what happened to the coal. If you haven't heard this story, I'm sort of telling it now, I guess. Of course, the coal that was pulled away from the fire slowly grew cold and died in the sense that it was no longer hot. And the man he was visiting got the message. When I was growing up in southern West Virginia, me and my buddies, we did a lot of camping. Because you could do that back then. You could turn kids loose with 22s and fire, and, and they wouldn't kill each other and burn the place down. We'd, we'd take our rifles, and we'd go up in the woods, and, and we would clear out a place to camp, and we'd build a fire. And we would sit around that fire almost all night long. And now when you build a fire... You, you put all these sticks together and the ends stick out kind of like a big star or wagon wheel, however you want to describe it. That's how we usually built our fires. And, and where is the most of the heat? Well, it's in the center. It's where all of those pieces of firewood converge. And it's the same with us. That's where the fire is. That's where the heat is. That's where the Spirit of God is when we really converge together. Now, as that fire would burn, of course, all of that wood doing what it does, it would be consumed. Well, when the center was consumed, it would leave the, the outer ends of those pieces of wood that we had put in the fire. So you've got all these individual pieces of wood that now are away from the fire because the fire in the center has burned and consumed the center part of that wood. And it never failed. This is what we look forward to because we would take those individual pieces now, put them together in the middle, and we called that... A stob fire, because we took all the stobs, all the stobs of those pieces of firewood where the other part had burned. And, and that was the best kind of fire to have. Stob fire. You take all those individual pieces and you put them together where you've had a fire before, and it's just like, wow, it's really going now. And that's what we are. This congregation was established back in the 30s. Is that right? And they did great back in the 30s. And we've got all that history going back, all the wonderful things that took place. But look at where we are now. We're the stop fire. We're burning hot. Yeah, amen. What's it going to be like in 20 years? Don't you think this congregation is going to be something to see in 20 years, in 30 years, in 40 years, in 50 years when a lot of us are dead and gone? And they're going to say, you remember Brother Marty? Oh, yeah, he was crazy. That guy, I said. Yeah, we want this place to be filled with the glory of God. But not just this place. We want this community to be impacted with the glory of God. And that's why, that's one of the main reasons we come together as the Lord's people. Because we know that we need each other. Because it's dark out there. It's hard out there. It's difficult. There's a lot of evil. There's a lot of sin. There's a lot of hardship and heartache. And if we don't have each other to pray for one another, to lean on one another, I... When I am visiting with people who lose loved ones, in the church we often talk about how do people make it who don't have the church? How do people make it who don't have God in their lives? And if you've got God in your life, you've probably got the church in your life. And that's where we really see the value is when things are not going right. And things weren't going right here in James, but he said, you've got an assembly you better keep assembling. Now, that's not the only letter. If you look at the Revelation, I, I know maybe it's getting old by now, but I want you to see that the Revelation, the first three chapters, what are chapters two and three all about? 
letters that Jesus has dictated through John to, to whom? To the churches. Seven churches in Asia. The seven congregations. What are congregations full of but congregators? That's us. Why do we congregate? Well, maybe it started with Jesus. In Matthew 18, you may know it well, but if you don't, you look at Matthew, or chapter, chapter 16 and verse 18, rather. And Jesus said to Peter that he was going to build his church. How many of you know what the Greek word for church is in that context? The Greek word is ekklesia. And I don't talk about the Greek and the Hebrew a whole lot because a lot of the time when you're looking at the Greek and the Hebrew, it, it just, what we've got in English is a very good translation. But this is a very interesting word to me. The word ekklesia that is normally translated church literally means a called out assembly. So Jesus says to Peter, Peter, I'm going to build my called out assembly. Now it's one thing to be called out. What are we called out by? Called out by the gospel. You heard the gospel and you said that gospel's for me. I've got sin. I've got guilt. I've got to have somebody take care of this because I can't take care of that on my own. Like Dwayne was saying during the Lord's Supper. We worry about sin and now we don't have to because Jesus has paid the price and taken it away. So we're called out of the world, called out of darkness, called out of sin through the gospel. But what are we called out? We're called out as an assembly. We get together. There's so many things in the New Testament that we could go to and say, well, this, this shows that we're supposed to assemble. That shows we're supposed to assemble. Just the idea of shepherds and sheep, like we talked about earlier. Just the fact that in some of these letters, he said, now when you get this letter, you read it to the congregation, and then you read the letter that came to the church of the Laodiceans. And back and forth, they're reading these letters. Because they didn't have... You didn't get a PDF. You didn't get the letter. We'll just scan this and then we'll email it to everybody and they'll have it. How did everybody get that letter? Well, the church came together and they read that letter. Would that be cool? Get a letter from an apostle of Jesus, an apostle that Jesus chose, and you sit down together and you're, and you're hearing this letter read for the first time. You've never heard it before, but this is a word from God coming through one of his son's apostles. That's the way they did it. And they would say, uh, can I have access to that? I'd like to copy that letter down. And then you, with your own hand, you write that letter out. And what do you do with that letter? Well, you study it, and then you show it to other people, and you may mail it to your friends and family elsewhere because they did have a mailing system. And when they would get that letter, they would get together and they would read it. That's what people did. I'm not against our present culture, but I think we've lost some stuff. I think we've lost some of the natural sense of family that we used to have. And I, I know I'm not trying to say that the old days were better. I'm just saying that they're different and we need to be aware that they're different. Because today you, you got your car and... It used to be you'd ride around with your windows down and you could yell at people and holler at them. Hey, what's going on out there? Honk the horn, put your arm out the window. Now we keep our windows rolled up. Why? Because air conditioning. Man, air conditioning's great. Anybody for air conditioning? I'm for air conditioning. Thank you, Mr. Train or Coal Train or whoever that guy was that invented. What was his name? I know the guy. That, anyway, whoever invented I, I love it. But you keep your windows rolled up and you don't visit with people so much. And then you get to your house and you get up to your garage door and you get this little button on your car. And the door goes up and you drive in. You hit it again and the door goes down. You're inside. Why do you stay inside? Air conditioning. It's great. Besides, you got TV. You got a computer. You got all kinds of games to play. You don't need to go outside. Used to be that people sat on their front porches in the evenings because the house was so stinking hot. And you go out and sit on your porch and you talk to each other and you go, let's go play some cards and let's go out and bowl. No, I'm going to sit inside and play on Facebook. And they didn't do that. We didn't have that stuff, thank the Lord. And kids would get out in the field and they would play. They would play ball and they would play whatever. And they didn't have to have 14 adults out there to ride herd over them and make sure nobody was getting cheated or being bullied because we just took care of things. Uh, 
I, maybe I'm painting a rosier picture, of, but I'm, I'm talking about a time when people were more together than we are now. We don't spend time together like we used to. That's just our culture. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to, I think, we need to take pains to make sure that we do spend some time with one another, even beyond the worship assembly, to get to know one another, to get to appreciate one another, to get to figure out how to tease one another. Because you can't tease somebody right if you don't know them. And it's fun to tease people. You just ask Donnie Deathridge. I don't think he ever meets a stranger. But that's what fellowship is all about. That's what being one in Christ is all about. That's what being family is all about. And isn't that what God is all about? He made us all in His image, and His image is always being together with somebody else. So this morning, I give you this lesson. In case you ever come up against that question or that issue, and somebody else has a problem with getting together, maybe you can help shed some light in their world by these things. But that, that text we started with is the one I want to end with, and it's from John chapter 17. John chapter 17, Jesus is praying this prayer. He's, he's right on the verge of offering up himself to die. And this is what he says. He's, he's been talking to the Lord about the apostles, but he says this, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, these apostles alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. Who's that? That's us. That they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that, there's that phrase, so that, so that what? So that the world may know that you have sent me. What's one of the best testimonies to the world that God has sent Jesus? The fact that you're here today with the rest of the church. The glory which you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know, there he says it again, that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Do we love each other? Yes. Oh yeah, I think we do. It shows when we're here. It's one of the reasons I like to be here. And I thank you for coming. I know you haven't come for me, you've come for the Lord, but you benefit me. We benefit each other. And so I praise God for his plan for us to get together. Let's pray. Lord, we lift our hearts to you. We've been doing that for a while now, but we lift them up now specifically to thank you for this plan that we would come together. Thank you for your plan to draw us out of ourselves and into the lives of other people. Thank you for this plan that helps us to focus on what's going on with other folks whom we need to learn how to serve rather than simply being self-serving. Thank you for this plan that helps us to become so much larger than we ever could have been simply focusing on ourselves. Thank you, thank you, and help us to keep this plan in Jesus' name. Amen.